Miss Lynn and welcome to It's Elementary with Calvert Library. Today I'd like to share a book with you called Ada Lovelace, Poet of Science, the first computer programmer. This book was written by Diane Stanley and illustrated by Jesse Hartland. I'd like to give a big thank you to the book's publisher, Simon and Schuster Books for Young Readers, for allowing us to share it with you today. Let's take a closer look. Long, long ago, on a cold winter night, a lonely little girl walked from room to room in a big old dark country house. Her name was Ada Byron, and she was looking for something to do. Ada was good at imagining things. She imagined it would be fun to fly. Then she went about it in a scientific way. First, she studied the flight and the anatomy of birds. She decided her wings would be like theirs, only larger in proportion to her size. She would build the frames out of sturdy wire so her wings would be strong, then cover the frames with oil rubbed silk so they would also be light. Finally, she designed a harness to attach the wings to her back. She thought it would be fun to fly from house to house delivering the mail. She'd need to bring a bag for carrying the letters, a map, and a compass for navigation. She decided to write a book about her flying project illustrated with pictures and diagrams. She would call it Flyology. And when she had finished that, Ada had a plan to build a steam-powered flying horse. Her mother, Lady Byron, was away at the time, so Ada sent regular updates on the flying project. She signed the letters, Your Affectionate Young Turkey, or your affectionate carrier pigeon. She had never been so happy, but Lady Byron was worried. Ada seemed overexcited. Worse, she showed dangerous signs of too much imagination. In other words, she was acting like her father. Ada's parents were as different as chalk and cheese. Her father, the famous poet Lord Byron was a worldwide celebrity, the rock star of his time. Her mother, Lady Byron, was interested in math and science. She was rational, respectable, and strict. The marriage only lasted a year. Ada never knew her father. He left England soon after she was born and died in faraway Greece when she was eight. She wasn't even sure what he looked like. His portrait had been covered with a cloth. Being Lord Byron's daughter shaped Ada's childhood in important ways. Ada's mother wanted her to be calm and rational, not emotional and creative like her father. She hoped the study of math and science would suppress her daughter's imagination. So Ada was given a world-class scientific education. Her imagination was not harmed in the least. Ada loved machines. She lived during the Industrial Revolution when things that were once made by hand, from ribbons and spoons to paper and glass, were being mass produced in factories. When Lady Byron suggested a trip to see the new factories, Ada was thrilled to go. Everything they saw was interesting, but by far the best was the mechanical loom designed by a Frenchman, Joseph Marie Jacquard. It would automatically weave cloth in any design you could imagine, from a simple plaid to fancy brocade to actual pictures of people, trees, and animals. But how did the loom know which pattern to weave? That was the amazing part. 
the design was translated into a pattern of holes punched into heavy paper cards. Long chains of these cards were fed into the loom, giving it instructions. To change the design, you only had to change the cards. Ada was amazed. It was a brilliant idea, and not just for weaving cloth. Why not use punched cards to direct other machines for other purposes? Ada was on to something. Soon, she would see how right she was. At 17, Ada's quiet childhood came to an end. Her mother took her to London for the summer social season, a round of teas, dinners, and dances. Ada was dazzled by the gilded ballrooms and the beautiful ladies in their gleaming satin gowns. Everyone wanted to meet Ada because she was Lord Byron's daughter, but Ada didn't know what to say to them. She didn't care about fashion, fox hunting, or court gossip. Then, she went to one of the weekly gatherings at the home of Charles Babbage, the great mathematician and inventor. All the interesting people went to his parties, from the writer Charles Dickens to the scientist Charles Darwin. As Ada moved through the crowd, from one amazing conversation to another, she grew almost dizzy with excitement. They talked about important things, astronomy and politics, literature and art, and the latest engineering marvels. These were her kind of people. A few days later, Ada went to see a working portion of Babbage's new invention, a calculating machine called the difference engine. It could solve arithmetic problems at the turn of a crank. People called it a thinking machine, but Ada knew better. The intelligence was not in the machine itself, but in the genius of its designer. Ada felt an instant connection with Charles Babbage. She even dreamed of one day helping with his important work. And so began one of the most remarkable friendships in the history of science. But Lady Byron had other plans for her daughter. Ada didn't need a profession. What she needed was a husband. So at 19, Ada married a wealthy aristocrat, William Lord King. When he became the Earl of Lovelace, Ada Byron King changed her name once again she would go down in history as Ada Lovelace. By the time she was 24, Ada had two children running wild in the nursery and one still crying in his cradle. But she hadn't lost sight of her dream, just postponed it. Now, at last, her moment had come. Babbage was working on a revolutionary new machine called the analytical engine. It would be powered by steam. There was no electricity in those days. And it could do much more than just add and subtract. The analytical engine could run any kind of mathematical calculation, then store the results for later use. Best of all, he had borrowed Jacquard's idea of using punched cards to direct his engine, so it could easily change from one operation to another. In short, Charles Babbage had invented the first fully programmable, all-purpose digital computer. But there was a problem. So far, his engine was just a plan on paper. It would cost a fortune to build. To raise that kind of money, Babbage needed publicity. This was Ada's chance to help. An article had been written about the analytical engine, but it was in French. Ada translated it into English so it could be published in Britain. Then, Babbage asked her to add some footnotes at the end, explaining what an all-purpose computing machine could do. She was perfect for the job. She understood how the engine worked. She was a good writer, and... She had the vision to see, better even than Babbage himself. 
how much more a computer could do besides just processing numbers. It could work with any kind of symbol, from words to musical notes. Ada imagined the analytical engine writing text, composing music, reproducing images, even playing games like checkers or chess. But before the machine could do any of those things, the symbols and rules of operation had to be changed into digital form. Today, we call that programming. Ada needed to explain to her readers exactly how that could be done. As an example to work with, she and Babbage chose an extremely complicated series of calculations called the numbers of Bernoulli. And then Ada showed, step by tiny step, how they could be coded for the machine. Finally, after nine months of meticulous work, sketch of the analytical engine invented by Charles Babbage was published. Ada's notes by the translator were almost three times as long as the original article and far more important. Yet she wasn't credited by name, only the initials A-A-L. She was afraid her work wouldn't be taken seriously if people knew it was written by a woman. Ada didn't care. The girl who had once dreamed of flying, who longed to do something important with her mind, had soared at last. She had looked into the future and imagined a computer age that wouldn't arrive for another hundred years. And in demonstrating how to code the numbers of Bernoulli, Ada Lovelace had written the first computer program ever published. The end. If you turn the page, though, there's a little bit more in the book. There's an author's note, a timeline of all those events we discuss. If you buy a copy of the book or check one out from the library, I recommend you check out all that lovely information. Can you believe that a woman in the 1800s invented what we technically use as computer code today? That's pretty cool. So today, we're going to make our own little coding game. You're going to need a couple things. You're going to need some big pieces of paper and some scratch paper, maybe a lot of scratch paper. You're going to need something to write with. You're going to need scissors and a ruler or something with a flat edge that you can use. So once you have that, we're going to start by making our computer game board. You're going to need to make a grid. So to make a grid, it's pretty easy. You use your ruler, your straight edge, and your marker or pencil that you're writing with and you're going to make some lines. So I'm making my lines about an inch and a half apart. It's easy to tell when you're using a ruler. And you just keep going across. My ruler is not as long as my paper. So when I get all the way through, I'm going to move it over and make sure they go all the way across to my two pieces of paper because I want this to be a nice big board. Once you go all the way across your page and all the way down, you're going to make some lines in the other direction to make a grid. So it's pretty easy to do that. If it's not perfectly straight, that's okay. So once you do all that, you're going to have your grid and it's going to look something like that. Does that make sense? Lots of squares. That's the first thing we're going to make. Next, we're going to use the scratch paper, and like I said, this doesn't have to be any fancy paper. This can be paper you were going to recycle. Mine is some old stuff, and you're going to make some game squares. What you're going to do is make little arrows. So some of your arrows need to point straight. Some of them need to go down and point one direction, and then some of them are going to point the other direction. So that's not hard to do. You'll want to cut out your paper if you want first into squares. Just some easy squares that are about the size of your game board squares, maybe just a little smaller. And then using your marker, you're going to write your arrows. I'm going to make some that are straight and some that are curved. So I made a whole lot of mine. I made about 20 that have that turn that direction. 
and I made about 20 that turn the other direction, and I made 20 that are just nice and straight. So you might want to pause and work on all that. Since you are using scissors, you might want to make sure you have a grown-up's permission or a grown-up to help you if you're still learning how to do nice, even cutting. What else you're going to need is some random objects from around your home. Now these can be simple things like a bottle cap or a paper clip, or if you want to get more fun into it, you can have little erasers or maybe little toys that are tiny. What else is helpful but you don't have to have it is like some little building blocks and little maybe some building block doors. Once again, if you don't have these, that's okay. So the other thing you're going to do once you cut out all your little squares is you might want to write on one the word start and on one the word finish. So I've done that on these ones. You can see it right here. That one says start and that one says finish. So you want to get all of your pieces together and then we're going to play a coding game. So coding is that building blocks of computer programming. And once you understand these very basic concepts, you'll have no problem coding all on your own. Let's take a closer look at how we're going to play our game. So you can see I have our game board grid we made and our command cards and our little start and finish and then all of our objects from around our house. I'm going to start by putting out our start. I think we're going to start our character right here and we're going to use this little lady as our character. You can use any toy from around your house that's small enough to fit in a grid or you can use a bottle cap or whatever you have. We're going to put her right there to start. Now we're going to put in our treasures that she's going to find. I have all sorts of little treasures, a little birdie, some bottle caps, oh there's a ducky quack quack, a doggy, even a little bumblebee. Oh and don't forget a couple of our paper clips. Oh and I even have a little paint set from a dollhouse. So I have my treasure. Now we need to give her some obstacles to get through. I made a little obstacle out of building blocks I'm going to put right there. And how about a couple little building block doors? We're going to close them to make it even trickier for her. We'll just put one to start. So, oh, we forgot our finish. Shall we have our finish be here in the corner? So now these are our command cards. We need to use them to make our little character here go through the obstacles and get all the treasures and then eventually get to the finish. That's why we made so many. So the first one I'm going to do is forward. She's going to move forward. Now, let's see, she's going to need to turn to go through that door to get the bunny. Here's a turning one. And now she's going to need to go forward again. All right, great. Now, which direction should she go? Maybe forward? Let's move her along and see. Forward, turn, forward, through the obstacle. And now she's going to need to go forward to get the bunny. But let's make her turn after she gets the bunny. Here we go. We got the bunny. Yay. Now we're going to the bottle cap. I think we'll turn after we get the bottle cap so that we can go get the paper clip. There we go. And now she's gotten the bottle cap. Our command cards made us do all that. Oh, we're going to need to go forward again so that we can get the paper clip. Once we get the paper clip, I think we'll turn so that we can go down and get that paintbrush. Oh, we got our paper clip. Now forward. Should we turn again so we can go down to that paint set? There we go, she turns. Now we need to go forward. We need a couple of forward cards now, don't we? That's why we made so many. There we go, let's get forward. And we can, oh, she fell on the paint. <laughs> she got the paint now. All right, we have some choices here. Finish is there. And we could go to finish with our command cards. That'd be easy, but we wanna go get all of our treasure. We have a lot of treasure. 
maybe we should forward one more and then turn to go up and get that ducky. So let's turn that way, turn. Let's go for that ducky. Straight, straight. We're gonna get the ducky. Now we're gonna go through the obstacles. I love ducks, aren't they fun? We're gonna need forward command codes to go through that obstacle. Oh, she's falling, but she made it through. Hooray. Oh, now we need to get the dog and the duck. So let's take a turning command card. Makes our character turn. We're gonna need a straight one. Maybe another turning one. We got the dog, yay. We're gonna need to turn again to come back and get that bird. And the paper clip, I almost forgot the paper clip. So she's turned. Let's put some four words out. And another turn. Do, 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 do. She got our paper clip. Woohoo! Now we're gonna turn again. So we need to get the ducky. But I have run out of forward cards. I guess I didn't win that round. So you see the idea. Maybe we should have just gone to finish there or made some more command code cards, which you're welcome to do. Like I said, I just made 20 of each, but maybe I should have made 40 forward command cards. You can do many, many different variations of this fun, basic coding game. So once you've figured out how to put together this game and do your coding, you can play it by yourself, you can play it with a friend, you can do all sorts of stuff with it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Be sure to check back with all of our social media feeds for more programs for the whole family from Calvert Library.